thrilled you're joining us for the first Friends at Home event in 2021, and we're delighted to kick off this season with Georgia Hunter, an acclaimed author. My name is Karen Butter, and I'm president of the Friends of the Alameda Free Library in Alameda, California. Before we get started, I want to review a few technical details. This is a live webinar, and it will be recorded. The audience, the audio for the audience is muted, and the video is turned off. So you will only see the speaker, her presentation, and me for part of the time. Please use the chat feature to introduce yourself and to ask questions. We do monitor the chat and ask that all participants act with respect in their comments. One tip for infrequent Zoom attendees, during the event, you will see the presentation and Georgia in a small window. By clicking on Georgia's window, you can move it around the page if it interferes with your viewing of the presentation. Finally, please understand that we learn more about hosting webinars with each event. We've practiced, but issues may arise. We are far from experts, but work hard to create a great experience for everyone. Before I turn it over to Georgia, I wanna tell you a little about the Friends of the Alameda Free Library. As president, I'm joined by a board of 15 dedicated Alamedans. The Friends is a nonprofit organization that raises funds and advocates for an outstanding public library in Alameda. Despite the pandemic, the Friends is committed to its role as a library support organization. Our virtual docent and author talks since the shutdown have been very popular and we've had more than a 1500 attendees. Additionally, we sponsor an online used bookstore offering books and grab bags from our alamedafriends.com website with bike delivery on the island. A new set of books is added every week, so check out our website. The Friends at Home events provides an opportunity to connect with you and to share common experiences. Thanks to our supporters for their ongoing donations so that we can continue to honor our commitments to the library and to support Friends at Home events such as these. We ask that you consider a donation to the Friends in any amount that is comfortable for you via our website at alamedafriends.com. Now on to our program. We are delighted to welcome Georgia Hunter to Friends at Home. We Were the Lucky Ones is Georgia's first book and was on the New York Times bestseller list for four months. It has been translated into 16 languages and has been selected as a top pick by Harper's Bazaar the New York Post, People Magazine, and Audible, among others. Additionally, it has been optioned for a television limited series. Georgia has loved to write since she was a child growing up in rural Massachusetts. She graduated with distinction from the University of Virginia and now lives in Connecticut with her husband and two sons. I turn the program over to Georgia and her remarkable story. And please use the chat to ask questions. Georgia? Karen, thank you so much. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you so much to the friends in, of the Alameda Free Library, to the other Karens behind the scenes, Karen Romer, Karen, Karen Manuel, and David Beal, who have given me such a warm welcome and so enthusiastically promoted this event. I can't believe how many of you are here with us tonight. Uh, I also want to say a special thanks to a few family members. Uh, my mother, Isabel, and my aunt, Kathleen. I wish I could see you, but I'm waving at you. Kathleen makes a, a guest appearance at the end of the book as a newborn baby. So if you've read it, you might have met her. And she's right there in Alameda County as well. Um, so, and I also just have to say thank you to you all for, for joining tonight. I know this is an incredibly challenging time. We're all feeling isolated and overwhelmed, but uh, this is one great excuse to get together and hopefully we'll provide a happy distraction, um, a healthy distraction, and a good opportunity for some questions and conversation. So I really look forward to hearing from you all. Um, and with that, I will share a few photographs that I brought with you to um, this evening. Here we are. Uh, I'll tell you a little to tell you a little bit about my journey in unearthing and recording this 
piece of my family history. So we were the lucky ones is based on my grandfather's past. He was one of five um, Polish Jews and the story follows him, his four siblings, his parents, as they scatter at the start of the war on a twofold mission to survive and to reunite. Um, and interestingly, this was a piece of my family story that I actually had no idea existed as a child. And I grew up very close with my grandfather. Uh, this is me at age one with, Ad with Addie, who you meet in chapter one, who I knew as Eddie. Uh, when he moved to America, he Americanized his name and um, I called him Papa. We were very close. I was close with him and with my grandmother, Caroline, and we spent a lot of time together, family dinners, birthdays, holidays, and yet my grandfather's Holocaust era past was a chapter of his history that he never spoke about, just wasn't in our dialogue. I would have to wait another until I was 15 years old um, and a high school English teacher assigned us a project called an eye search before I meant phone, it meant I myself, we were tasked with interviewing a relative to learn a little bit more about our ancestry um, and in turn about ourselves. And so my grandfather had passed away the year before I was 15 years old and I decided to sit down with my grandmother, Caroline. And it was over the course of that hour uh, and that interview that my grandfather's story came to light. And I was shocked, but I wasn't angry or resentful for discovering this piece of his past and my past. I was more curious and I had a thousand questions and my grandmother was able to answer several of them for me, specifically about my grandfather. So I learned that his family was from Radom, Poland and central Poland, but my grandfather was the only one of his siblings who was living in France at the start of the war and that he had managed somehow to find passage on a ship that left Marseille bound for Rio. Uh, and that he actually met a young woman on that ship, a young Czechoslovakian to whom he was engaged, they fell in love, and that he finally landed in Brazil. And where, when he did, he lost complete contact with his family back in Poland for the duration of the war. And when I asked my grandmother about that family back in Poland, she said, you know, there's not so much I can tell you. I met them after the war and like your grandfather, they rarely spoke about that time. So fast forward again, about eight years and I finally got a few answers to some of my questions. And that happened at a family reunion that my mother hosted at our home in Massachusetts. My mom is here on the right, Isabel. This is her sister, Kathleen. Here is my grandmother, Caroline, the matriarch in the middle. And to her left is Felicia. So if anybody has read the book, Felicia is my grandfather's young niece, who is a year old at the start of the war. So I think we numbered 32 in all at our peak in this reunion. My mother invited all of her first cousins. She's one of 10 and they flew in from France and Israel, California, Vermont, Florida, Brazil, all over the world really. And we had this kind of loud, crazy week together where we had multiple languages being spoken all the time, lots of different kinds of food prepared, music being played. And one night of that reunion, um, I wandered out back to where my mom and her cousins were sitting around a picnic table. And I sat down and I realized they were telling stories about the war. And I leaned in and I realized they were stories unlike anything I'd ever heard before. Jose was there and he talked about how he was born in the Siberian Gulag. He had no idea why his parents were sent there. Uh, he just said that his mother told him he was born in the dead of winter in March and that when he was a baby, he would wake with his eyes frozen shut and that she would have to coax them open with her breast milk. Another Another uh, relative talked about how her parents were, how her mother had hiked over the Austrian Alps on foot to safety after the war for fear of going, having to go through checkpoints at train stations, all the while pregnant with her first child. Uh, Victor talked about how his parents were married in a very illegal, very secret wedding in a blacked out home in Lvov. I heard about a mother-daughter escape from the ghetto. I heard about a disguised circumcision. I mean, the stories kept coming and coming. And I remember sitting there and thinking, 
how have I never heard these before? And someone needs to take the time to write them down. It would be eight years before I gathered the courage to decide that that someone would be me. So in 2008, I finally put a stake in the ground and said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to try to unearth this chapter of my family history. And that began with a whole lot of travel. So this slide shows my, a map of my research travels. I was living in Seattle at the time. And my first stop was to Paris. And that was to visit with my grandfather's niece, Felicia, who I mentioned was one year old at the start of the war. And she's also my only living memory, li living relative with firsthand memories. So it was very important for me to meet with her. And I was so incredibly grateful for her time and her courage. I was very gentle in my approach with my interview um, because I wasn't sure how much she would remember or be willing to remember. And I was just blown away by the details uh, with which sh she was able to share her story. And from such a very young age, um, I've since had children and I've put them in her shoes or tried to imagine them in her shoes as a two-year-old and a three-year-old. And I mean, even myself, I can't remember much from those early years, but her memories were so vivid. And I think telling of the times, uh, heartbreaking, but uh, a lot of people ask, very specific questions about Felicia's story and whether those particular events are true. And the answer is always yes. The answer is they all um, came actually straight from Felicia. My next stop was to Brazil, to Rio de Janeiro, to visit with Michelle here. This is one of my mother's cousins, uh, the son of Ginnick, who was the brother who was shipped off to Siberia. And we had the best time uh, running around Brazil and visiting old addresses in the National Archives and collecting records. And the photo on the right is of a bay called Guanabara Bay. And this was a really important place in my grandfather's story. And without giving too much away, if you've read the book, there's a scene towards the end where he borrows a rowboat and paddles out to greet a ship that's coming. The scene makes me cry every time. Um, but I loved standing there in his footsteps and looking out over this bay and imagining that happening and imagining it probably didn't look all that different than it does today. As my story started to come together, I started to piece the individual storylines, my grandfather's, his siblings, and, and I did think going into it that my grandfather's would be one piece of the story and then the family left in Poland would kind of be the second storyline. But immediately I realized through my interviews that every single one of my grandfather's siblings and spouses and often their children and parents each had their own path to survival. I think part of the reason why this whole project took me so long, nine years start to finish. Um, so as the story came together, I created a timeline and I color coded it by sibling to keep track of who was where and when. And, and little by little, the bones of the story did, they took shape. And yet there were still some places where I had a gap, of course. And, um, and this played into my decision to write the book as historical fiction rather than nonfiction, because those, there were some gaps that felt really important from a narrative perspective um, for my readers and for myself. I wanted to know, for example, my grandfather was uh, left Marseille um, with an illegally issued visa en route to Rio. The, the ship that took him was called the Alcina, and it was a journey that was meant to take two weeks. Well, the ship was detained for four months into college and again in Casablanca. The ship never left Casablanca. He had to find another ship to cross the Strait of Gibraltar, find another ship from Spain, which eventually took him to a little island off of Rio where he was detained again and then finally allowed onto free soil. And I wanted to know what did he and his then fiance, Eliska, do on that first day together on free soil? And I didn't have the story, so I decided if there was an event that, or a detail, a colorful detail like that, that was missing, to the best of my knowledge, through all the research I'd done in, on the history and on the family, if I could put on the lens, could it have happened? And, I, and the answer is yes, then I allowed myself that creative license. So there's a scene in the book where Addie and Aliska on their first day in Brazil, in Rio, take off and they walk down Copacabana Beach along this Avenida Atlantica, which had this beautiful mosaic and I knew my grandfather would have admired it. And in that scene, the two of, uh, the two of them stop just as 
Robert and I did for our first sip of coconut water. So I based that scene off of my experience on my first day in, um, in Rio with my husband, Robert, here. <laughs> When I ran out of relatives to interview, I thought who else might have a story to share that's relevant. And um, through a very long and deep rabbit hole, I was able to find Aliska, the ex-fiance. She was living in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and I wrote her a letter and she called me the day it arrived. I wasn't sure you know, if she would remember my grandfather or how mentally where she was. And she was 88 years old and incredibly sharp. She was so excited to hear from me. And she said, of course I remember, come visit me. So my mother and I flew to, South, flew to uh, North Carolina and we spent two days with her. And she had photographs and documents. She even had my grandfather before his work papers cleared in Rio had been, um, he kind of worked under the table. And one of his jobs was at a leather book bindery. So where he was binding leather books by hand. And she had two of his handbound leather books and gave us one. So it was remarkable in that sense to have these actual tangible pieces of my grandfather's past. And also in the sense that she was able to share this very human, very personal account of what it felt like to be a refugee leaving Europe at the start of the war, to be leaving everything and everyone behind to be on this ship with an illegally, she also had an illegally issued visa. She was Jewish as well. And, and what it felt like to be falling in love amidst the darkness of everything that was happening around her. So it was a wonderful couple of days spent together with her for which I will forever be grateful. And alongside my oral history, my reaching out to anyone and everyone who might have a story to share. I was also reaching out to ministries, magistrates, archives, museum, anywhere around the world. Um, you know, I'd look at my timeline and say, okay, this relatives was here. Maybe, maybe this museum or archive will have a record um, that's relevant to the family story. And so that often meant hiring a translator to write a query letter. Um, but I just kept, I kept a giant list of, um, of resources and I reached out and reached out and I again was amazed at what I was able to find. This letter came back to me a year after I had sent it from a ministry in Moscow and sure enough they had record of a relative in a particular place at a particular time and that felt like a little nugget of gold so I would drop that information into my timeline. This is illegible, but this is part of a nine page handwritten document that I found through the Hoover Institution, which is part of Stanford University. And my great uncle Genick, he's the oldest of the, the, the boys on, uh, on the family, in the Kirk families, he's the one who was shipped off to Siberia. And his story was very vague at the start of my research. No one really knew why he was sent there, how, for how long and how he was released. But in this document, he describes everything and more. So he describes why he was arrested the day he was arrested, the day he and his wife Harta boarded a train in Lvov and the 45 day journey to get to their camp in Siberia, the name of the camp, what they were asked to do there, made to do there. And then eventually why they were freed when Hitler and Stalin broke ties and Stalin said, okay, all you prisoners, you're free on the condition that you fight for me. So then what the year long exodus to, from Siberia to reach Persia entailed, which is where the army was gathering, uh, where the Polish army specifically was gathering. Uh, so this was just a, a wealth of details and information that I was so grateful to uncover, not only for myself and for my timeline and for my narrative, but also to be able to pass it along to his two sons and to the family um, and so that they could keep it as a part of their history as well. And because Ginnick did end up in the army, along with another relative, um, I reached out to the UK Ministry of Defense because the Polish army fell under the wing of the British army. And the British army took very great records, um, meticulous records. So I was able to follow his path and which battles, wh where he what he was a part of in Africa and in, in Italy. And it turns out he was a part of some really important ones. I learned a lot about what was happening uh, from a military standpoint. And he was actually part of one battle called the Battle of of Monte Cassino, which was quite a pivotal uh, turning point towards the end of the war, uh, toward 
for Allied victory and which the Polish army in particular played a very important role. And I was able to uh, find also that the that a couple of relatives, including Genek, had unclaimed medals of honor. And um, I was able to claim those medals and pass those on to the family as well. Another piece of my research that was also extremely helpful was I had access to several three uh, Shoah interviews, which I'm sure many of you know, Steven Spielberg put together the Shoah Foundation where he back, back then videotaped um, survivors answering questions. And so I did have access to three relatives speaking into a camera about their experience. So, uh, which was incredibly helpful of course as well. I also had some family documents. I hit up every single relative I could for photographs, documents, anything they might have. So for example, on my side, here is my grandfather, Addy, during a very short stint in a Polish column of the French army. So before he left France, he was in the, in the army for a little while. And he was also a composer. And I mentioned one piece in particular that he wrote called list, which means letter in Polish, that made him a little bit famous before the war. And this is his sheet music for that piece called list. I had this image of the Alcina, the ship that took him from Marseille that never made it to Rio. This was a great find thanks to uh, my mother's cousin, Ricardo. His mother, Helena, was the youngest of the five siblings and yet, um, seem to, in the end, be really the orchestrator of the family's safety in many ways. And a lot of that was thanks to, you can't quite tell from this photograph, but she had these light eyes, blue-green eyes and lighter hair, and she had a false ID. And this was her false ID. You can see here the name she chose, Brzoza, which means birch tree in Polish. And this is um, a document that she relied on over and over again um, to get people out of work camps, out of the ghetto, um, into and into hiding. And I just love her expression in this photograph, one of such courage and such defiance, which really defined the, the person that she was. This photo uh, was given to me by, by Victor, who is the baby in this photograph. His parents are Jacob and his mother is Bella. Jacob is the youngest of the three Kirk brothers. And um, this photograph was taken after the war when they are boarding what looks like a cattle car in Poland to make their way to Stuttgart, Germany to a displaced persons camp. And sadly, Bella's whole family had perished during the war. So I could only imagine what it entailed, how that felt to step onto this train car. So if I had an image like this or a piece of sheet music or a, any photograph, a document, I knew it would live verbatim in the book. So I created a scene around this photograph in particular um, where they're about to take off, the train starts rolling and Jack Jacob hops off the train and snaps this picture and hops back on. The last piece of my research um, that was also very important to me was to actually travel in the footsteps of the family throughout Eastern Europe and then down through Italy. I knew my first stop needed to be Poland to Rodham, where the family was from. And I was a little bit nervous, partly because no one had been back um, once they left and they got out. No one had any interest in going back. Um, and also just the history of the town. Um, in the beginning of the book, I put a statistic, which is that this town, Rodham, was once home to 30,000 Jews who made up about a third of the population. And after the war, fewer than 300 survived. So that alone gave me pause and reason to be a little, little bit nervous, kind of gave me this, this dark lens of, of what I might expect. And photographs like this, which show the entrance to the ghetto that was erected by the Nazis at the start of the war, where all of the Jews of the city were confined and eventually the ghetto li was liquidated. Um, and yet, I arrived in Rodham, my husband came with me, Robert came with me, and my first impression of the town, I'm gonna to show you the next picture, is of this very same street corner where the ghetto gates once stood. And my first impression was of just how beautiful it was and how quaint and livable. And I could imagine for the first time what life was like for my great grandparents, Saul and Nehuma, before, their lives were turned upside down. 
I could imagine what it felt like to go to the market, to go to school. There were poppy flowers, wrought iron balconies, lanterns. And it just, um, it made me, it made me understand as well why my great grandparents didn't up and leave right when things started to get a little bit dangerous. Cause I imagined I could really imagine life for them there. This is the entrance to their apartment. They lived on the second floor of this building. And I spent a lot of time walking in and out and in and out and in and out, imagining them doing the same thing. Um, I also felt the ghosts of the past in, in the city for sure. We had an incredible guide named Jacob. And um, this is an example. He, I found this rendering of what the town synagogue once looked like. And he took us by the square where it once stood and told us how the Nazis had come in and first used the synagogue as a stable for their horses and then burned it. So today this, this, the square is empty. He also really wanted to show us the old Jewish cemetery outside of town. So we went out there and I actually found this postcard of, of what it once looked like. So as you can see, it's, it's beautiful. There's hundreds, if not thousands of headstones, well-kept. Um, beautifully ornate and, and it's a postcard. So clearly there was a lot of pride in the cemetery. And sadly today, this is what it looks like. And again, Jacob explained that he, that, that, that the Nazis came in and ripped up the headstones in order to make an airstrip outside of town. So it was a very double experience, kind of, um, one of, okay, I can understand and visualize and imagine a happy life before the war. And then also this sort of very bone chilling um, kind of haunted feeling, but I'm so glad I went. And if anybody has any interest in retracing their, their footsteps, their ancestors' footsteps, I highly recommend it. Just, just being there uh, was, was a very powerful experience. The next summer, Robert and I uh, continued the exodus. So the first trip was through Poland and Czech Republic and Austria. We looked at the Alps that Helena had hiked over. We did not hike them ourselves, but we admired them. And then uh, we came back the following summer and we rented a car and drove one way down the coast of Italy, down the Adriatic coast, following once again in the path of the family members. And we, it was less research intense, but we did make a few important stops, including this one in Bari, in Puglia, the so southern region, where there was an important reunion. And I loved having um, Wyatt, our little guy there. He was four and imagining Mila, my grandfather's older sister, with her daughter Felicia there, holding hands on the platform, listening to the chirp of Italian, watching the trains come and go, and imagining what it must have felt like to be there and, and to see family members again for the first time. Um, and that was, again, very a very powerful experience. And I'm not sure how much Wyatt remembers. I think he, I mean, he, he remembers the trip, but he certainly was more interested in the gelato, I think, than, <laughs> than he was the family history. But someday he'll appreciate this photograph. <laughs> Um, and that really is um, kind of encapsulates the three, the three big buckets of my research, the oral history, the records, and then the travel. And I tried um, as best I could to pull this story together. You know, I, I had a I had kind of two goals, one to to honor the family history, to tell the story in a way that felt true to what happened um, and also Second, to, to do it in a way that my kids and their kids, and again, I didn't even have kids when I started the book, the process of researching, but I hope to someday. And I wanted them to be able to pick it up and read it and have it feel relevant, have it feel less like a history lesson and more like something that they could relate to, more visceral, more colorful. And that was really the goal. And I tried hard to, to balance um, those two aspects, the history and then the personal piece. And I found uh, to do that, I really had to imagine this, um, 
this family who was living through this incredibly dark period of time, but they were living it in color. So again, allowing myself to, to create those details, those colorful details of what was happening around them. And for my family, what I learned is it wasn't all dark. You know, they were somehow surviving. They were staying out of the concentration camps. They were falling in love and they were having babies and they were making music. So in the end, the book really ended up being a I tried to create a balance between the extremes, the dark and the light, um, the dread and the hope and, and, and the themes throughout, which feels so sort of scarily relevant today of courage and perseverance and hope and love. I just tried to weave that throughout the whole thing. So, um, Hopefully I achieved that. I hope that you enjoyed our talk. I'm going to um, turn it back over to Karen and would love to hear any questions that you have. Um, let me see. Yes, um, uh, it's an incredible story, Georgia, and you're so fortunate that you were able to um, connect with your grandfather and the family before they died, because I know um, personally, we have stories in my family from uh, the previous generation, but we didn't do anything uh, like what you did. And, you know, I really regret that we don't have all of those stories. So it's a fascinating story. And thank you for all of the, the background and the history. Um, I do have a, a, we do have some questions for you. Um, one question that I have is, did you find more um, relatives um, after you published the book? Were there more stories that came out um, following the publication? That's a great question. I've had so many people reach out to me via my website or Facebook with um, a Kirk last name Kirk or a, some version of it or uh, a different last name of a, a spouse or somebody, another relative or character in the book. And sometimes I'll go back and some the deep, deep family trees and I'll find a connection. Um, but yeah, I, it's, it's been a, our family, I actually had to, for this book, kind of narrow down the scope of the project because, or the scope of the narrative, I should say, because um, there were actually 22 relatives in all who survived. Um, my, I decided to focus on my the five siblings and their spouses, but there were actually cousins and, and further down the line family members who survived as well. Um, so I, I can't say I've like reconnected with relatives that I didn't, hadn't, yeah. No idea they existed before, but um, it has certainly brought me so much closer to those relatives that, you know, the second and third generation relatives who I spent so much time with um, in their homes and over the phone and Skype and things like that to try to, to try to uncover our, our story together. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, going on to some of the questions. Um, uh, Karen says the part of the book that haunts me most is the scene with Mila and Felicia with Mila digging her grave. I'm wondering if Felicia remembers that event and what she thinks about it now. Yes, that's one of those questions that the answer is yes, that story came from her, which is, again, to me, you know, you, you, you think about that scene and of course it's po impossible to forget, but she was three. <laughs> she was so young. Um, and yeah, and, and, and all of Felicia's stories uh, are her own and they're true. That scene in particular is terrifying, but true. And, and I remember thinking partway through my interview process, well, maybe some of these stories her mother Mila passed down to her and she's just kind of recalling them from her mother's memory. But then she would share a story that, for example, even she was even younger when they were still in Rodham and there was a, her mother would bring her to the factory with her every morning and hide her under the table. And there was a, a raid, a Nazi raid. And Mila had to put, had a plan in place and was to put her in a little bag of fabric scraps and hide her there and, and then left. And Felicia describes the stomp of the German boots as they came in the ground vibrating beneath her. She wet her pants. She was worried because she, the, the paper bag where she was, she was, breathing in and out and she could hear it crinkle. And so those are just, those are details her mother could have never known. Um, so to answer your question, yes, the stories are all true. Um, 
What do you think it was about your family that made them so brave and so committed to survival? Oh gosh, I think, I, I think everybody was brave at the time. I think, you know, I think their mission was, was really, you know, to, to, because they scattered and kind of came in and out of each other's lives, mostly out. I think they had the extra motivation to find each other again, but I don't think they were any more courageous or, um, hopeful than others. Um, I, I think they had their fair share of luck for sure. But I also, I will say, I do think one thing that set them apart is that um, they always, they always had a plan and whether that, so for example, that scene by the train where Mila decides they're digging their graves and Mila decides to tell her three-year-old daughter, Felicia, to run to another woman across the way who seems to have been spared and call her mama. Say, mom, yeah, go run to that woman and call her mama. And so that plan she made up quite at the last minute, but that's an example of they always had some way of staying a step ahead. And then I think they would choose that path and that's where the luck would come in because it was very lucky that Felicia's could run to that woman and did not get shot in that moment mm -hmm. um, by the guards standing by with, with their rifles. So Danielle says, hi, Georgia, I absolutely loved your book. As a librarian, I have the opportunity to recommend and do recommend your book all the time. Are you working on another book? If so, can you tell us about it? Sure. Thank you so much for recommending the book. I really appreciate that. It's always great to hear from librarians, um, especially. Um, yes, I am. I'm working on a second book and I'm, I'm stuck on the, the era. I really, I, I feel very close and attached to World War II Holocaust. And that said, I feel like I have exhausted the, the Kirk family story. So my ancestry piece, but I do feel like there are parts of, of that chapter in history that are a little less understood than others. And one of one of those chapters is um, what was happening in Italy and in Greece. So I'm going to set this next one in Italy and Greece. And I did think a lot about this, the themes of, of we were the lucky ones as I decided what I might write about next, because that first certainly felt more like a calling than, you know, like I didn't just think of the idea out of nowhere. This was my family story. And the whole point was to try to get it down on paper for the family. So it's a bit of a different experience. Um, creating a plot and creating characters on my own. But I, I, I thought about those themes that resonated, which are our ancestry and family, mother-daughter, mother-son relationships. Um, and so this one will be about a young mother and um, young Jewish mother living in Italy. And it's really a story of survival. I'm also going to weave in a strong story of friendship um, with a young Greek woman. So we'll get some Greek history too. And um, it's going to, I'm, trying to highlight what was happening in Italy, which was very, uh, very nuanced and complex compared to what was happening in other parts of Europe. So their path will take them south towards the allies. Um, and, and along with that, I'll have a second storyline told by a more modern day narrator, perhaps someone like myself, <laughs> um, told in a place where I'm kind of very familiar with a setting, maybe a some somewhere in Massachusetts where I grew up. And that'll be told from the perspective of a young woman who is spending some time with her ailing grandmother. Mm -hmm. And over the course of a month together, her grandmother's, a secret is revealed that kind of changes everything. And of course the two stories will eventually overlap. So that's where I am now on book two. I'm about, I'd say a third of the way of the way through my first draft. <laughs> so when do you think that will be published? Well, um, Hopefully next year, if not very early uh, the following year. Yeah. Okay. Something to look forward to. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, are the pictures that you showed in the book on the uh, today? Oh, no. There's one tiny photograph of me with my grandfather, but that was also um, when I, I learned that in, in historical fiction, which is technically a novel, uh, publishers are much more resistant to family photos. So, um, so there is one, one little photo of, of the one I showed with me at one year old with my grandfather, but it's also another reason I kept a blog throughout my whole research process really as a way to keep the family abreast. So when I go 
to Paris or to, to Rio and I'd come back with a discovery or I would write about it and kind of what, what it meant to me. And I would also upload family photographs and, and findings and documents. And I'm so glad I have all that because that's sort of my piece of the story. And a lot of the photographs you saw today are there and, and many, many more. So if you're interested in seeing more photographs or kind of diving into the, the research process even deeper, you can go to my website, georgiahunterauthor.com or we were, we were the lucky ones.com and you can search by, you can search Felicia, you can search Rodham, you can search by keyword and chances are a blog post um, will pop up about that subject. <laughs> Great. Um, so Kathy has two questions. The first is when you visited Rodham, were there any Jews living there and did they return? And then the second one is, uh, did Salim and Neela remain married? Yeah. So interestingly, I asked that same question of our guide about whether there were Jews now living in Rodham. And this may have changed in the four years since we've been there, but he said, you know, if there are, he said, I think there are, but I'm not sure. If there are, they're not talking about it. So it was slightly heartbreaking. Um, I will say Rodham in particular of, of the towns uh, in Poland is doing an incredible job of, of recognizing and honoring its Jewish past. Um, and, and I appreciate that so much as a descendant of a, of a Rodimer. Um, so my hope is that someday that population will grow again. But like I said, after the war, really, I, I don't think anyone went back. And those who did try to go back, I've read stories about it, it being a pretty horrific experience right after the war. Um, and then what was the second question? Um, did uh, Salim and Mila remain yeah. married? They did. They did. They remained happily married. They just had Felicia, the one child. Um, Felicia now has two children and four grandchildren. She still lives in a beautiful apartment overlooking the Eiffel Tower in Paris. So people get very worried about her because she had a very, obviously a very traumatic upbringing. But um, I think of, of all the cousins she was, mm -hmm. I've met and, and learned about, she's certainly the the most reserved, and I'm sure she has scars that will last her lifetime. But from my perspective, at least, she always seemed very poised, very happy. Um, and, and again, her ability to just even to open up and to talk about it, I think is telling of where she is mentally. So how did you manage to keep all the storylines in chronological order? Was that difficult? That timeline came in very handy. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I, I first started with individual um, timelines um, and then realized I really, I needed to know when these relatives would lose track of one another. And then occasionally they'd come back, but mostly they scattered. And I just thought when I started writing, it was just a, an easier way to keep track, to try to do it chronologically. But by color coding my timeline by sibling, it was so fascinating to see where they all were and what they were all doing at the same time. Mm -hmm. Um, one in Krakow and one in Siberia and one in Rio de Janeiro. And, and, and you knew they were all thinking about each other the whole time um, and trying to find a way to stay alive and to reunite. But it, it was challenging to keep track with the, the putting it in, in chronological order was a huge help. Mm -hmm. um, what's the current status of the TV adaptation? As I read the book, I keep thinking about how it would make a wonderful limited series. Oh, Thank you. So it's a, it's a fun project. It's ongoing. The book has been optioned by, um, sorry if I can tell this in a short way. I, we I have a dear friend. His name is Tommy Kale. Uh, he went to camp with my husband. So we've, he's known Tommy since he was about 14 and I've known him since I was about 19. So Tommy worked his way up in the theater world to eventually be the director of Hamilton, the musical, which I'm sure you've heard of, and now is directing shows for, has directed Fosse Burden and, and has his own production company. He's got dozens of shows under his belt. And he called me about a year and a half ago and said, hey, buddy, like, let's do this together. I want to option your book and let's, let's see if we can make this happen. And it was a dream come true because... It was never in my vision to the, a that the book would 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 land in so many readers' hands and b that it would end up potentially on a screen and and it made me a little nervous to think about that to be honest because these are these are my relatives they're not characters and I didn't I mean if anybody exploited it or took it in a direction that I wasn't comfortable I would be 
horrified. So um, with Tommy at the helm, however, <laughs> it all felt different. It all felt right. And so we worked together. We found a screenwriter. And then also recently, 20th Century Fox optioned it. So I have a producer. So now we're just waiting for the third and kind of most important uh, step, which is to find a network. And we're, it's, we're in the thick of it. It's happening now. We're pitching and it's exciting. So we'll see. I'm kind of in that whatever happens, happens. I'm along for the ride. And I, I will get to be a part of it if it happens and very much as a consultant and, um, you know, be a part of the process. But, uh, but I, have, I don't have anything riding on it. <laughs> I just hope if, if it happens, I'm so grateful to have the team behind me that I have. Um, somebody said, your family story is so beautiful and inspiring. Words can't describe how much it has touched me. You said that you were aiming to make it visceral and colorful, and it truly was. I'm a fan of World War II fiction, but this book was the first time that I could truly see what it would feel like to be a family of Jews. So inspiring and beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I love that. Um, and somebody else, Kay, said, do you have a favorite passage from your book that you would like to read aloud? Oh gosh, I have, I have a couple. Um, let me see if I can find a short one. Okay, I'll read this one. So this one um, is told from Genick's perspective. So we're, if you remember, Genick is the brother who was sent to Siberia, who eventually uh, left Siberia and joined the army to join the army. So this is August of 1942. And this is about a year after he's left the Gulag. He's traveled thousands of miles uh, to reach Persia, to join the army through Russia, Central Asia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. And he is just entering Tehran. He is in the back of a truck filled with these soldiers, these ex-prisoners who are in tough, tough shape, dying of disease and starvation. Um, and they're being greeted by the soldiers of Andres' army and, and by the people of Tehran. Um, so this is a story that I actually read about this, this type of thing happening in my research. I didn't hear it from Genick's children as a story that he had passed down, but I was so moved by hearing these other firsthand accounts of these soldiers and what it was like to arrive after their exodus in Tehran that I knew I, would, I wanted to include a scene like it. So a second sphere sp sails overhead and this time Genick reflex reflexively catches it. Why would the locals taunt such a pitiful looking group of people, he wonders. But when he opens his hand, he finds an orange, a nice one too, fresh, plump. The first piece of fruit his fingers have touched in over two years. He glances over his shoulder to see if he can spot whoever threw it, catching the eye of a young woman wearing a maroon headscarf, standing on the sidewalk with her hands on the shoulders of two young boys in front of her. She smiles, her brown eyes soft and full of pity, and suddenly it's clear the orange wasn't hurled as a sign of disrespect. It was a gift, sustenance. Ginnick's eyes well up as he rolls the fruit between his palms, a gift. He waves at the Persian woman who waves back and then disappears into a cloud of dust. Genick can't remember the last time a stranger did something nice for him without expecting something in return. He digs a dirty fingernail into the orange, peels it and hands a wedge to Herta, his wife. She bites off a piece and holds what's left of it to Jose's lips, laughing softly as his nose wrinkles. It's an orange Jose, she offers, a new word for him. Pomaranza, soon enough you'll learn to like it. Genick peels off a wedge for himself and closes his eyes as he chews. The flavor explodes on his tongue. It's the sweetest thing he's ever tasted. It's beautiful. Um, Robin said, I know you explained why you opted to pursue the story as nonfiction. I'm wondering how early on in the project you chose to not convey it as nonfiction. Was it only because you felt there were gaps in the stories or were there other reasons that you opted to create a fictionalized version? That's a great question. I can't say, I, yeah, I did not make that decision early on. Again, my goal was to just tell it as truthfully as I could. And, uh, and I also felt like by, by imagining it um, and bringing it to life in a way that felt like I was there in, in the relative's you know, wearing his or her shoes and stepping into their 
hearts and, and minds, it almost brought it closer to the truth than these sort of segmented pieces of stories that I got in my research. That said, I wasn't able to interview, aside from Felicia, interview these relatives firsthand. So every single thought, um, worry, concern, uh, their dialogue, everything was was fictionalized in that sense. You know, I knew where they were, how they'd gotten from A to B to C, I had the bones, but that connective tissue was missing. And so I just didn't feel right saying this is absolutely what they would have said and thought and how they would have felt. And so for me, I just felt more comfortable um, calling it historical fiction. Interestingly, I had one publisher tell me that they would only publish it as nonfiction because the stories were so unbelievable. They didn't want readers to think I made them up. And I get that, like the story, I think the stories are unbelievable. So, but it was just, it was one of those things that just kind of felt right to me. Yeah. Um, one question that I can answer, um, will the library make available to borrowers multiple copies of George's book? And I believe there are copies in the library. Um, we have purchased or will purchase a couple of copies as well. So people can um, borrow the book from uh, the Alameda Free Library. Um, Nancy asks, from inception to publication, how long did it take? Nine years. Nine years. Almost exactly. I set off in February of 08, and it came out on Valentine's Day in February of 2017. So. Um, uh, somebody said, I love that you wrote this in the present tense. It made me feel connected to the characters. Why did you choose to write your book this way? I think that goes back to my goal in telling it in a way that that felt more relevant and a little bit more modern and less less historic, um, and trying to and trying to really put readers into the shoes and hearts and minds of of these these Kirk siblings. Um, so I'm so happy to hear you say that. Thank you. <laughs> that was the goal. <laughs> how did you just, how did you sustain an emotional distance from heartbreak, reunion, fear, in order to compose a literary mirror of feelings? Ooh, um, that, that was hard. Um, and, and I don't think I steered clear of it. I think I just let myself feel what I needed to feel or what came naturally to me. So there was, there were tears, there was laughter, um, there was anger. Uh, I think part of what allowed me though, to write this book in a way that what I hope doesn't, um, feel, resentful in any way was the fact that I didn't know about this story for so long. I didn't grow up with this kind of shadow over my head and, um, or any kind of resentment and anger. And so when I went into my research, I truly went into it with curiosity and just this thirst for answers. Um, and I, and of course, I think that the, the ending, the, the fact that the family survived and the complete statistical anomaly that, that the, my relatives that to survive intact, um, I, I'm not sure I would have had the courage to write the story or to, to be so deeply emotionally involved in it had, it, had I not known the ending. Um, it was really hard for me to write about Bella's family because she did lose her whole family. And, but it was also really important for me to write about that because that was the norm. That was what was happening everywhere. And, um, and so, yeah, it was hard. It was really hard. It wasn't they, these, like I said, these aren't characters, they're family members. So it was, made it extra challenging. <laughs> um, Daniel asks, would you care to comment on current events compared to your family story? Oof. <laughs> you know, I, I guess I'll just say I never thought um, back in 2008, setting off in, in, into my research that, that the story today would feel so relevant. Um, it's a scary time. And I think more important time than ever to to share these stories, to keep them alive in whatever way we can, and and to have these conversations. I mean, this is this is the time to to want to kind of dig a little deeper and understand um, why where we come from, why we are the way we are, and and we all have those questions about ourselves and our ancestry. But I think if we could kind of bridge those gaps and and understand kind of people who think differently or look differently or act differently and try to understand where they come from and why that might be a good first step. But, um, 
but yeah, it's uh, it, the themes, <laughs> the themes certainly feel scarily relevant today. So final question, what would be your dream cast? Oh gosh, I'm so bad with Hollywood. Like I'm the like names. I'm one of those people who didn't grow up with TV, MTV or, you know, um, I guess without, without naming names, I just hope that with, with this project, I've been so lucky keyword that everyone involved has been as passionate about it as I have been, which is remarkable because this is so personal to me, but I put it out after like, I was so terrified to send it out to anyone, but I, my mother read it, my husband read it and a dear friend read it. And finally, I sent it to agents. My agent is, she, she, after one day said she wanted to work with me on this and she has infused so much love and passion into this project. And the same thing happened with my editor at Viking and the three of us just worked together and infused so much love and work. And, and then for Tommy to pick it up and now for this team of this screenwriter who has taken it and written this beautiful pilot in a way that I could never bring my stories family to life. Um, so I would just say that I would hope that whoever, if we are lucky enough to turn this into a series that, the, that these actors sort of share that passion, this sort of feeling like we have to tell this story and I can't wait to do it. And it doesn't, you know, won't feel like a job. It'll feel more like something that's uh, like my own experience, like, like something I'm going to do and it's going to be, it's going to be amazing to work together. So that's, that's my hope, but I'm open to suggestions. If you have any, <laughs> I know the director, send them my way. <laughs> Uh, um, I really want to thank Georgia for sharing her amazing story with us. And um, it is just incredible. And uh, I hope everybody has a chance to read it. So thank you, Georgia. And thank you all for attending our event. And um, for Alamedans who haven't read the book, copies are available at Books Inc. on Park Street and in the Alameda Free Library. For the next few months, we have a, outstanding Friends at Home programs. On January 27th, join us for a docent talk, Birth of Impressionism, Masterpieces from the Musée d'Orsay. And we have four events in February. On the 8th and 24th, we'll learn about African-American art sponsored by the Rotary Club of Alameda, hidden in plain, plain view, exploring the rebirth of African-American art during the Harlem Renaissance. And on February 8th, Reve Revelations, Art from the African-American South, and that's on February 24th. And we have two author talks in February, one on the 10th, Elsa Hart will talk about her highly acclaimed mysteries set in 18th century China and featuring a librarian. And on the 17th, Robin Sloan will discuss his books, Mr. Penumbra's 24 hour bookstore and Sourdough. So a ve very full month of events and please plan to join us. And please consider a donation to the Friends of the Alameda Free Library at alamedafriends.com. This will allow us to continue to sponsor events such as these. Watch our website, newsletter, and Facebook page for additional events and to register. Finally, thanks to those who made it happen, David Beal, Karen Manuel, and Karen Romer for assistance with event managing and Zoom and registration. And finally, a special thanks to our author, Georgia Hunter, and thanks to you for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Thank you.